I'm Sherry D. Franks. I will be discussing intrapartum care for positive childbirth experience and the concept of the goddess myth. The definition of goddess is slightly varied depending on what you read, but essentially it is a woman who is greatly admired, worshipped, and has power over a particular part of nature or part of the world. The Greek Titan goddess Leto was known as the goddess of modesty, womanly demure, and also of motherhood. As depicted alongside, she represented the epitome of female beauty, modesty, and motherhood. The concept of the goddess myth as it pertains to humans was highlighted in an article published in Time magazine in 2017. It told the story of a woman who had recently experienced childbirth and the issues surrounding it. It discusses how, as women, we are convinced that we are akin to goddesses as it pertains to childbirth and motherhood. The primary idea is that women are built to build humans and that in doing so we feel more empowered because that's what nature intended discusses that women should feel and look radiant during pregnancy, that choosing a natural birth is the obvious and right choice every time, sending your baby to a nursery is somehow a dereliction of beauty, and of course breast is best and is the only right choice. This concept is instilled and encouraged by society, the internet, and by healthcare providers with the best intentions. However, this perfect vision of what pregnancy and childbirth child birth should be can be damaging. The article in Time discusses the story of a woman who throughout her pregnancy was told that she should have the most natural birth with meditation and a pool full of body temperature water to alleviate her pain. She was active on Facebook groups about her plans and experiences. Once she went into labor, she had felt confident that with a natural home birth plan, her midwife, her doula and her husband, she would be fine. However, 30 hours later, she was rushed to hospital and after receiving an epidural, had delivered a healthy baby. She thereafter strictly breastfed until that too became an issue at five months due to an undiagnosed thyroid problem. She stopped participating in her social media groups because she felt she hadn't succeeded. She had prepared so much only to be disappointed that her physiology wouldn't do what needed to be done. A survey of 930 mothers commissioned by time showed that half of all new mothers experienced shame, guilt, regret, and anger due to unexpected complications and lack of support. It was found that women often refer to deviations from the societal norm with negativity. Women who are induced refer to themselves as unsuccessful. Women refer to giving in to an epidural and to stopping breastfeeding for selfish reasons, including bleeding nipples, lack of sleep, and returning to work. The article goes on about the literature, social media, and societal ideas that are to blame for this expectation and for the ultimate negative experiences that women have around childbirth and motherhood, despite having a healthy child. The negative self-image of being a mother greatly affects women everywhere. In that vein, the WHO has launched a global strategy for women, children, and adolescent health. Part of this campaign is to ensure that women and their babies not only survive labour complications, but also that they thrive and reach their full potential for health and life. In order to achieve these goals set out for 2030, evidence-based recommendations have been made for the intrapartum care of women for a positive childbirth experience. The WHO recognises a positive childbirth experience as a significant endpoint for all women undergoing labour. It is defined as an experience that fulfills or exceeds a woman's personal and sociocultural beliefs and expectations, which includes giving birth to a healthy baby in an environment that is clinically and psychologically safe, with continuity of care, and with practical and emotional support from a birth companion with kind, technically competent staff. This is based on the premise that majority of women wants a physiological labor and birth and to have a sense of achievement and control, involvement in the decision-making and even in the med medical interventions needed or wanted. The issues addressed in these guidelines is that despite research, the normality of labor is in fact not universal or standardized. With the increasing medicalization of childbirth, Women's capabilities undermined and this negatively affects her childbirth experience. And use of labor practices with no clear indications often widens the health equity gap 
between high and low resource settings. The aforementioned issues are addressed by identifying the most common practices used throughout labour and establish norms for good practice for the conduct of an uncomplicated labour and birth. We need to elevate the concept of experience of care as a critical aspect of ensuring high quality labour and childbirth care to improve women-centred outcomes. These outcomes should not just be complementary to the provision of routine clinical practice, but in, should in fact be the most critical aspect. WHO guideline is applicable to all healthy pregnant moms and babies and takes into account that childbirth is a physiological process and can be accomplished without complication for the majority of women. The WHO guideline is comprehensive and consolidated. It is not region specific and acknowledges that variations exist globally due to the level of available health services within and between countries highlights the importance of women-centered care to optimize the experience of labor and childbirth. It introduces a global model of intrapartum care that takes into account the complexity and diverse nature of prevailing models of care. Let's now highlight how the national guidelines compare to this WHO model. There are some common recommendations and these are generally applicable throughout the various stages of labor and childbirth. It includes respectful maternity care, which involves maintaining the dignity and privacy of our patients. It ensures freedom from harm and mistreatments and enables informed choice and continuous support. Effective communication between healthcare providers and women in labor is also a common recommendation, as well as companionship during labor and childbirth. Continuity of care um, is According to the WHO, one specific or small group of midwives that support a woman throughout her antenatal, intrapartum and postpartum phases. While the South African guidelines do recommend continuity of care and should be maintained as far as possible, it is difficult in our setting, but with the correct use of the maternity case record, this is improved. There are similarities in the guidelines as it pertains to the first stage of labour. These fundamentals already highlight the clear consensus that creating a safe environment that makes a woman feel safe and in control is important even if in a developing country such as ours. Allowing a patient to mobilise or stay home until in the active phase, offering companionship, an acceptable position for the mother and safe evidence-based care is what is recommended in both guidelines. While this is in the process of changing, the big differences in the guidelines ex exist in the definition of what latent and phases of active labour are, as well as the duration and the progress of the first stage. The WHO definition of the latent phase is regular contractions and cervical dilatation until 5 cm, whereas the national guidelines define the latent phase to 4 cm dilatation. And so the active phase will then be from 5 cm according to the WHO compared to 4 cm in South Africa. The 2017 WHO guidelines suggest that the duration of the latent phase varies and so there is no limit to it. The active phase is said to last 12 hours in first labours and 10 in subsequent deliveries. The WHO has suggested that the rule of dilatation at what? 1 cm per hour is often too stringent for most women and should not be an indication for intervention, provided the maternal and fetal well-being is reassuring. In South Africa, latent labour longer than 8 hours in a birth facility is termed poor progress, and as is dilatation of the cervix at a rate less than 1 cm per hour in the active phase and often warrants intervention. Both guidelines agree that analgesia is a very important aspect of labour. The differences do occur in the type of analgesia. Both guidelines recommend a birth companion as it is noted to reduce analgesic requirements. WHO recommends that analgesia should in fact depend on the patient's preference. It lists an epidural, fentanyl, pethidine, warm packs, massage and mindfulness as all appropriate forms of analgesia. In South Africa, epidural analgesia is not readily available due to resource settings. In a systematic review, it was in fact found that women repeated mixed, reported mixed experiences 
of different pain relief methods. Some experienced negative side effects with pharmacological methods, while others found no reduction in pain with non-pharmacological methods. It is on that basis that the WHO recommends analgesia that is requested or referred by the patient. The second stage of labor is defined in exactly the same way in both the WHO and the South African National Guidelines. The duration is similar, and both guidelines agree that two hours can be allowed for the fetal head to descend. Maternal position during delivery should actually be dependent on the patient's preference, including squatting and semi-fowlers. Pushing with an epidural is not mentioned in the South African guidelines, but the WHO recommends delaying pushing until the sensory urge to push has returned. There are no differences in the guidelines regarding the third and fourth stage of labor. Both guidelines recommend routine uterotonics, oxytocin IM being the most recommended. Active management of the third stage with controlled cord traction is still the most recommended in avoiding PPH. Delayed cord clamping for at least one minute is encouraged and encouraging early skin to skin contact and breastfeeding at the earliest opportunity is also recommended in both guidelines. The take home messages A positive childbirth experience is defined as one that fulfills or exceeds a woman's personal and social cultural beliefs and expectations. Failure to meet these expectations can lead to negative sequelae in mothers and ultimately in children. These expectations include the delivery of a healthy baby in an environment that is safe, in the presence of a companion and with technically competent staff. Women should be included in the decision making with respect for patient autonomy. This requires effective communication to ensure informed consent that will lead to better maternal and neonatal outcomes. While the differences in intrapartum care are largely due to resource setting, the basics remain the same. Healthcare providers are required to empower themselves and become competent in the intrapartum practices of their setting, ensure positive experiences and outcomes for all women.